Welcome back, and I hope you've all had productive breakout sessions. We will now head into the final session of this creativity track, a fireside chat with Brenda Romero. As always, remember you can post your own questions in the Pine Questions and Answers panel for Brenda to answer. Brenda's a BAFTA award-winning game director, entrepreneur, artist, and Fulbright Award recipient. She is the game director and creator of the Empire of Sin franchise and has previously contributed to over 50 titles across notable series and franchises. Thank you for joining us, Brenda. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. So uh, first of all, I'd like, I like to say personally that uh, games are tools of empathy. So your TED Talk on Gaming for Understanding really struck a chord with me. How do you think games convey the experience of others better than other mediums? Oh, geez. Um, in so many ways, really. I mean, I, you know, and I'm sure like if there were other, like if, I, if there was an artist or um, uh, an author uh, or a musician here, they, you know, they might beg to differ. But what I love about games is we can put all of those things together. And unlike other traditional media, we can actually invite the player to participate and to affect the outcome. And to not just have, you know, this is my painting and this is the thing you see. And obviously you could take multiple things from it, but fundamentally a game requires that player. It requires that interaction. And therefore, because you have that, you can have such, you know, such deeper interactions and meaning generated from the game, I think. Yeah, definitely. Having a player make those choices can be quite weighty, uh, particularly when they're difficult choices, correct? Yo, absolutely. I mean, in, in the, the series of board games that I made, I mean, that's what they're all about. I mean, but, you know, even even I would say I'm seeing that showing up loads more in in standard video games as well, you know, that your choices can lead to, you know, pretty serious consequences. Yeah, um, absolutely. Do you feel like there's a way to design games to ensure that the player is feeling particularly involved with the situation and decisions they're making and they have more empathy for the character they're playing? I do. I mean, I think if the player has a, if the player has, let's see, uh, I have like five answers to that question. And they're all fighting in my head right now. I, I think there's at the base level, right? Like if you have players and they're engaged with that character, they have agency in how that character grows, they are in effect creating that character. That's a huge, hugely important thing to do. I mean, I had one of my, I think it's fair to say bigger regrets. This is gonna sound silly now that I've led into it with bigger regrets. I threw away a five and a quarter inch disc that I'm sure nothing could be read on the disc, but it had my characters from the, one of the earliest games that I played, a wizardry game. And I just was like, well, I don't have an Apple II for starters. It, this is nothing I can probably even read on the disc anyway. And I just got rid of it. And I still, like, I still, like, why did I do that? I would have framed it and put it on the wall or something. You know, and that's the kind of attachment that a game designer would would kill for, it. you know, to have players care that much about, about a game. Um, I also think part of the attachment comes down to being able to see yourself in the game. So if there's a game where you have, um, where you can create characters, can you create a character that looks like you? So you feel like you feel like you are represented in that world and the things that you would, the choices you would choose to make are reflected in the characters that you have. Um, that is, I think that's also a huge part of, of getting players to attach. Yeah, I, that makes a ton of sense. And obviously why having those characters that re represent a diverse range of people can make more people feel uh, involved in the games that they're playing. Yeah. So when it comes to giving create uh, giving choices to players, you know, letting them have agency, do you think there's a sweet spot? I mean, if you let a player be able to do anything in the entire world in your game, regardless of how hard that is to program, do you think that might actually have a negative effect? Oh, I will. I, I mean, the, first, the funny part of it, my first thought is, is like the sweet spot is money, right? The sweet spot is how much time, how much development time do you have, right? Um, but I think I, I, it depends ultimately, like if you put a player into a sandbox with no direction at all whatsoever, um, for some players, that's just not going to fly. That's not going to be something that's of interest to them. So 
And that is the, you can do anything that you want to do. Uh, so I generally try to provide some kind of breadcrumbing, whatever it is, just, you know, here's, here's a variety of different ways you can go. You can choose which way that you want to go for whatever seems to work best for you. But I think some degree of breadcrumbing is useful. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. So you've worked on a wide range of games. Are mm -hmm. there any titles or development experiences that particularly stand out to you? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, some for some for like, did that really happen reasons? And then others that were just fantastic. Like I, I often talk about uh, Gunman Taco Truck which was a game that we worked on with my son. And he was nine when he came up with the idea for it. He was learning, John was teaching him how to code. And he came up with the idea of a, of a, of this, of a gunman. So basically um, it seemed like orca fiction at the time. Uh, seven atomic bombs are accidentally set off in the U S. Um, and so all, all of the animals are irradiated and most of the humans who gather in safe zones. So you take your taco truck coming up from Mexico, you take out the animals and then feed the remains in tacos to the humans at the safe zones. And you're trying to get to Canada, Winnipeg. Um, and this is, this is the idea of Donovan, who was nine at the time. And we just thought the idea was so fun uh, that we made the game and released it. And, uh, you know, he ended up getting featured by Apple a few times. And the, like he, he, the money that came in from Gunman, you know, he's paid his way through college. So... Um, so that's fantastic. And I'll always love, you know, working on that game as a family. Uh, and then, you know, Empire of Sin has been fantastic. You know, we have a, our team, you know, we've been working together for, well, as a team for five years and Empire of Sin is uh, in its third year. And it's just, it's been great. You know, even though we've had like weird struggles, like for instance, all suddenly working at home, you know, it's, it, we're a really tight team. Um, and so I've really, I've actually really enjoyed this development process, which is, I would love to claim credit for the whole thing, but I can't, it's, I can't claim, I can barely claim credit for it. It's, you know, it's down to the team that you're working with. So when it comes to working with those teams, you say you're very close to uh, the people that you work with on Empire Sin. How does that compare to working with your family and your own son? <laughs> well, now that you, so, so funny enough, I mean, John, John and I still, John and I work together. Uh, Donovan, who is, uh, was the designer of Gunman Taco Truck, he's done some, you know, some testing just because we're all stuck at home. And, um, you know, if you want to play the game here, that would be great. Uh, but it's different. You know, this is... Um, uh, Gunman Taco Truck was a we'll finish it when we finish it and 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 we finished it and out it went. Whereas Empire of Sin, you know, is obviously a big game shipping on five platforms. It's it's a lot different than the a, a small we'll finish it when we finish it. But the team's been the team is um I mean when you get a team that just gels well together, you know, it's it is uh we don't have to tell the team, for instance, that it's time to go to bed. Right? Like we're like <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> Yeah. Though, though sometimes I feel like some team members do need to be remembered, reminded to take a break and perhaps rest. Oh, fair. Yeah. So, um, you know, you've had quite a, a long and successful career so far. What were the challenges that you've faced across your career and, and how have you overcome them? Um, gosh, I mean, it's been a long, it's been a long ish career. I, so what are the challenges I've overcome? Um, oh God. You know, I mean, I think it's funny because I'm sure that there are loads of them. Like when you said, you know, different teams, like there's, there've been super weird moments, right? Like where you find out that, that a, a publisher has actually taken your game and is behind your back, building another copy off your code base. That was fun. Um, so there's weird things like that, that happen, right? Or you talk about a game with another publisher as, you know, potential to make it and they actually go ahead and put that into production. There's all kinds of weird stuff that happens. Um, there are challenges, of course. Um, but in the end, like I, I was talking today, I also spoke at a different conference and the conference that I spoke at was for students who are in second level or might be known as 10th grade, depending on, depending on where uh, you're listening from. And I was telling them that, you know, I've been making games for a long time and I can't imagine doing anything else. I mean, to me, this is my first love. This is what I want to do. And so like with any job, there are going to be challenges. There's going to be people who you wish you, you know, you, you don't, you think, 
thanks. That was, that was an experience. I, we don't need to ever work together again. But at the end of the day, like I will take all those challenges to be able to do what I do for a living because the, the upside of making games is so much greater than the downside. Um, I love what I do for a living. I can't imagine doing anything else, you know? So like to me, a real actual downside would be if I had to work like an insurance company all day. That would be a downside for me. Like somebody like, how can I help you with your claim? I would much rather like behind, <laughs> behind the screen, um, what I literally underneath you right now is a JIRA ticket, right? You know, and so I, I would much rather be going through JIRA all day than doing anything else for a living. So while I'm sure there are downsides, um, the upsides way outweigh it. You know, the game industry feels like a home and a family to me. And, um, and yeah, so that's not actually the answer probably you were looking for, but, but that's, <laughs> that's what comes to mind. No, oh, yeah, I, I totally understand. I mean, um, I I started out in biotech and joined the game industry and would never ever look back ever um, because, as you said, the game industry is is such a family. Um, yeah, and, it is. Uh, so I I wanted to to note that um, you were named one of the fifty artists, actors, authors, activists, and icons for making making the world a more stimulating place. <laughs> Um, how do you see games, particularly in the time of this pandemic, contributing to the good of the world? Isn't that, you know what, what a great about face that was too. So I don't know if you remember, of course you would remember this in your position. It feels like seconds before the pandemic hit, games are the new pariah. We've been the pariah many times actually, <laughs> but this is yet another, another go at, you know, let's just let's take video games out of the knee. So video games are, you know, they are, it's like of the list and they've been trying this for a long time in fairness to legislate it. So there's like crack cocaine, heroin, video games. And like video games actually were once Leland Yee did this in the state of California, tried to class video games with heroin as this incredibly addictive substance, um, which, which is obviously ridiculous. But so games were this, just before the pandemic hit, there was this whole discussion about, you know, video games. We should be playing video games. Pandemic hits. It's like, play video games. Video games are a necessary form of escape. They're a good thing. And it was almost as if everything that had been said, it's like, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold up. We're, we don't mean that anymore. We're going to go. Um, we'd, we'd like to we'd like to talk about something else. And I think I think games provide, especially now an incredibly necessary form of social interaction in a virtual world that we quite obviously, like I, I live in Ireland. Um, so we are in, I think we're in week four of a six week lockdown. Um, so I can't, you know, I mean, I can like go out and exercise or whatever, but I'm not, I'm not going shopping. I'm, you know, except for essential stuff. And, you know, I think games provide us this necessary and beautiful levity and even outside the pandemic you know some of the experiences that i've had in games like um I, just to name three that i often talk about inside uh what remains of edith finch and um that dragon cancer breathtakingly beautiful works of art you know that you couldn't get in any other medium um you know and these are things that games give to the world i think i don't know I don't know when it will be that that games are accepted as a as a cultural art form at the same level as books and film and say TV are. Uh, I feel like we've taken a big step with with BAFTA recognizes recognizing games as one of their big pillars, um, and so uh, you know hopefully hopefully we'll have more of that. Sorry, that was not meant to be my my mini little TED talk there. <laughs> no, I, the, that's why uh, everyone is watching. I think everyone wants mini little TED talks here. Uh, your words of uh, advice and inspiration are, are wonderful. Um, somebody actually just asked a question in the Q&A, which I'd like to remind everyone exists in the Pine chat. So feel free to put your uh, questions there. And they said, I totally agree that video games are an art form. In your opinion, why is it still considered as a less noble art form, for example, when you compare it to writing? Is it because video games are younger? I think that's part of it. And, and I also think it goes, it's, it's, it's all, I think also about cultural acceptance, right? So we're, 
we're still at a point where, um, or, or cultural age, maybe even I want to say, we're still at a point where people will say, oh yeah, I don't play video games. Um, and, and certainly there are, I've heard loads of people who will say, yeah, I played a ton of games and then I went to college and I had to chill it out or I was going to fail out. Uh, so I think we all go through different periods, but there is still a, a huge swath of people for whom games have just never been a thing, right? At least video games have not been a thing. But I believe that will change. And we are going through the exact same form of, of cultural growth that most artistic mediums went through up to and including fine arts like painting. And painting at one point in time was considered, this is how we will decorate wallpaper. We will have, you know, famous artists come in. Well, they weren't famous artists at the time, but like, you know, Michelangelo did that sort of stuff. Right. And so now, um, now I'm not, I'm, I've maybe have just gone way too far by, by bringing out a, a <laughs> by bringing out somebody like Michelangelo, but we will, we will, I believe eventually get to that point. You know, we're seeing, um, you know, some of the canons of games, you know, if you bring up Tetris, most people in the world have heard of Tetris. Most people have heard of Pac-Man. Most people have heard of Doom. So there are certain games that have made it outside of our, of our, you know, let's say game world. And eventually, uh, as, as games continue to mature, we'll go even further. Now, here's the funny bit about this. Here's actually what I think is the biggest limitation on games and their cultural acceptance is that there's still some countries in the world that if you are, if you cannot, if you, your game cannot be played by somebody under the age of 17, you are refused classification. And in that legislation, we say games are for kids. Right. If you have a certain degree, like you still really can't sell games with adults only content at the adult only content being something that absolutely could be in a film. So again, you know, this is games are games are like PG 13 or whatever. Right. But that, I feel like that's fading. Uh, I feel like that's changing. Um, but while that's still there, we will still have some of that, but if just a, a quick look at what happened with photography as an art form, it, you know, it went through a similar, like, that's oh, not a real art. You're just pushing a button. You know, it's, it went through something similar to what we're going through. Do you think this pandemic is going to accelerate that transition? Uh, I doubt it. You know, like I, I, I doubt it will. I think what will accelerate the transition, if anything, is the move to all digital distribution. Because the, you know, the all digital distribution means that the ultimate barriers and gatekeepers of content are no longer countries but companies and you know that like you know there's there's upsides and downsides to that obviously yeah yeah accessibility is is certainly a big one um so now sort of switching gears uh i wanted to ask what do you see as the core elements of good game design oh my gosh um <laughs> i know you what? could do an entire <laughs> ted talk on this probably well yeah long. <laughs> But that's like, oh, good. You know what to, to put me on. That's a great, like, I'm glad I didn't, I don't know any of these questions before. Cause you get to see like, oh my goodness. Okay. The core, ele core elements of good game design. And I get to tell you this while I'm being recorded. So I can, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny. no, I can look back at it later and go, what in the, um, core elements of good game design. I guess, first of all, I would say as, um, as a, as a, so I'm a game director. Uh, I would say the first core element of good game design from my position is the word help. Um, and to make sure that I've got great people on the team and that I don't assume I know how to do everything myself. Um, I've seen, you know, games can go off the rail if, if a design director is, a, is also a dictator. So the first thing is to surround yourself with really good people and invite people to challenge you. And um, uh, I think that's critical. Also, as a game director, it's knowing when to say yes and knowing when to say no. So a zillion ideas are going to present themselves. Um, what makes the core of the game stronger? I should have put that probably as number two. What is the core of your game? So what is the one thing this game is about? And making sure that every single thing that you think of comes up against that as a razor. So will this make the core stronger? If I take it out, will it make it weaker? Um, scope. 
obviously is critical. I mean, games will design. If you gave, if you, if you told the game designer, you have a month, that game designer will hear I have 45 days, you know, and I'm not exempt from that. Um, so making sure that you are ruthless in scope and, and deliver on the core and leave room for iteration, uh, which is almost always necessary, especially if you're trying to make something unique that other people haven't done. Um, I think too, when we're talking about the world of digital games, you know, I, it's good game design is more than just the, the idea. Good game design is, uh, is good gameplay code. You know, it's the ability to hand off your ideas to somebody else and have them have, you know, like I can describe how I want something to play, but at the, at the end of the line is that gameplay coder and she has to figure out exactly how to implement what I want to give that proper gameplay feel. Um, you know, and then good, good feedback, whether that feedback is audio, whether that feedback is tactile. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could, you're right. I could absolutely give a little mini Ted talk, but I'm, I'll just stick with, I'll stick with that. It's important to ask for help. It's important to ask for experts and you have to know the core of your game like nobody else. And um, bear in mind that the game, especially if you are a game designer, the game cannot speak for itself and the game will let itself be driven off a cliff. So you, we are as game designers, the only voice that the game has. And so when something, so we have to speak up, we have to play, we have to say, this isn't fun. This isn't working. Um, so being a voice for the game as well. So almost all of those points that you touched on involve really good communication with your team in both directions. How yeah. do you ensure that good communication and candor between your team and yourself? It, uh, well, it, it, there's two different answers to that, right? There's, there's the answer that I would give you now versus the answer that I would have given you pre pandemic. Um, the answer pre pandemic would be, we have an open office. Uh, so I, I've learned to overhear every conversation. Um, but we, we, what we do, especially now is we make sure that everything is tracked. We have, uh, we meet, um, daily and just talk about what are the things that we think are important. We do regular play sessions, like, like every day or every other day. How does this, here's what we've done. How does this feel? Um, but we, we talk a lot. I mean, we have, we're, uh, you know, I have a three monitor setup. So normally this is where the game is or whatever I'm working on. This is everything I need for what I'm working on. And this is my, like, that's every form of communication with everybody. Um, uh, so it, fe it feels like that's my exact same setup. That's oh, why I'm it? here. I have, I have my monitor for communication, my like main development monitor, and then my reference monitor. Yeah. Yeah. So I can't even, I remember, I'm sure at some point in my life, I had one monitor, like if I ever had to go back to one monitor, oh my Lord. Um, but yeah, communication, I mean, everybody knows communication is critically important, but I think it's also critically important to just track it through the process. Um, so I, at the highest level, like make, making sure that you have qualified producers who can, um, uh, who can just who can make sure that everything is getting done, that you're not becoming a bottleneck. Like design directors can become exceptional bottlenecks. You know, if you have to review everything, and um, and so uh, good producers, good ways of tracking things as it going as it's going through the system, um, and particularly. Particularly now that we're all stuck at home, um, you know, having some form of regular hangouts. Uh, uh, we do, in fact, we do daily standups. Even, even though we are, you know, the game is out on December uh, December first, we're still doing daily standups uh, every day, uh, and a lot of it is just touching base with each other. Yeah, absolutely. Keeping that connection with your team is so important. Yeah, it is. Uh, so we actually have another question um, okay. from the audience. Uh, and this is a little bit back on the subject we were uh, talking about before about games being recognized as an art form. With the new Disney Plus show Mandalorian using game engines to produce real-time environment rendering, do you think that the greater public will begin to take video games and game engines themselves more seriously? Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and I'll tell you why. So the very first ever, um, uh, machinima uh, was done was done with Quake, so people started. And so that's 1996. So I feel that 
people people who produce movies might take it more seriously. But I don't know that I don't know that like the general public is going to do that particularly. I think a lot of what a lot of what game engines do at their core is way over the head of uh you know of the average of the average person. It's like what hold let me just correct that. What game engines do at their core is way over my head, right? Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not a game engine programmer. Um, I certainly know a lot of game engine programmers and I, you know, I've been, I have been, um, I have, I have been, you know, someone sitting in the room listening to just, you know, basically our equivalent of Mozart's having conversations with each other about, um, about technology. And I really mean that, like, you know, obviously, you know, people who are watching, I assume know that, um, you know, know that I'm married to a pretty hardcore coder who's worked with you know, some of the most hardcore coders. So I've listened to these conversations. The general public, I don't think, I just think it's, you know, it's, it's so well above everybody's head. But the cool thing is, is I do think, um, I do think that people, that st studios taking an interest in game technology to develop things can only mean good things for the game industry. Yeah, definitely. The more people who are interested in that technology, the more it is pushed forward, funding, exactly. things like that. Exactly. Um, so I noticed that you've advised and directed numerous game education programs. What has made you so passionate about helping the next generation of game developers? I don't know. Because um, <laughs> I don't know, really. Um, but I but I, I really do. Like right now, you know, I'm, I'm mainline on a game, so I'm not doing anything that ha does not have to do with my game. Um, but I... Re well, you know, okay. Now that we already know that that's not true, because I just said before when I spoke today, I spoke at Science uh, Science Week here. So I talked about um, careers in STEM, in, specifically in games for kids. Uh, I I guess I just enjoy doing that. You know, I enjoy working with. I get it. I get it. I feel inspired. Like sometimes when people say, "Who's the person who inspires you?" and it's almost always. It's almost always somebody who's just entering games, who's so in love with it, who's discovering new things and sharing that with people. Um, uh, I find that I, that's just, I find it really rewarding. And there's also, there's also, especially if you've been making games for a long time and I've not, I've not heard anybody talk about this either, but there's also the, there's the danger of, well, I'll, I'll just make a name for it. I'll call it dinosaur creep. So here's what dinosaur creep is. Since I've come up with this stupid term, I'll, I'll now define it. So I've been making games for, how wide is the screen? Uh, there. Okay, I've been making games. Whoops. Okay, wait. There we are. Okay, sorry. I was looking at the wrong screen. I've been making games for this long. And that's all good and well, but really that much of my experience might be of value for the type of games that are being made today. And so by by having people on your team who are, you know, who, who don't necessarily have that breadth of view, it, you, you proof yourself from making decisions like, oh, this was great. And it's like, yeah, maybe it was great for the nineties, but like who wants that stuff today? Right. So, um, so I think that's important. And then there's the hugely selfish angle of it. The hugely selfish angle of it is, is when you are teaching, you can meet some of the greatest people. Um, people who can change your team. So like on the Empire of Sin team, I have, let me see, I'm just going to go around the programming floor in my head. Shane O'Malley, and Dave Riley, uh, both who came out of the University of Limerick, exceptional coders. They're out, and then there's Miguel, who's also out of the University of Limerick. There's Ian Dunbar. Ian Dunbar comes from uh, UC Santa Cruz. So, uh, and then Ian O'Neill, who came from DIT. So anyway, you just go like, when you teach these different courses, you you tend to meet students who are the standouts, and those standouts can join you eventually. You know, when they graduate, they can join you uh, as part of the team. And so, I would absolutely not be the first game developer who went and taught a college course and hired somebody out of that college course. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand. Um, when it comes to working with these students and these people who are just starting their career. Do you give them like any advice? Like what's your advice for someone who's just looking to start the career or to even transition to a different role? Um, 
Well, if we do just starting the career, uh, so uh, my advice class, class number one is actually pretty hardcore. It is one of you will make it into the game industry. If you're lucky, one of you, um, you need to be whoever you are. Like I, and I've seen classes that do this, like, oh yeah, that's, that's Darren. Darren's exceptional. I don't need to be like Darren. Cause I'll get in there as well. No, Darren's probably the one who will get in. Um, there are far more people who want jobs in the game industry than there are positions available for those people. Um, and the game industry tends to be home to the best, I'm sure, as you well know, the best and the brightest at everything. Um, and so I let them know that really to get in, you've got to work hard. You want to, you want to be able to put together, if you have to learn something, um, if you have to learn something, make a prototype out of it, you know, add to your portfolio in some way. Uh, for people who are wanting to change, do you mean like coming from an outside field? Oh, well, yeah. Uh, switching from programming to design or oh. from something like that. Uh, let's see. Switching from programming to design. That I haven't seen too many coders do that. I've seen coders go to producers. I think, I think that those types of switches, those interdisciplinary switches are fantastic because it gives you, you know, you know, ultimately you want to be happy with what you do. Like if I didn't love what I was doing, I wouldn't keep doing it. Um, when I went to college, my degree was this weirdo, weirdo mashup of half programming, half writing, which made sense. If, actually, it doesn't make super sense if you're going to be a game designer, but neither of those things, I don't do either of those things really much anymore. I'm usually just sticking all with design. Um, but, you know, I think, it, you know, ultimately it's, yeah, the, the advice my brother gave me when I was a kid, I was going to go work at IBM um, revising DOS manuals of all the horrific things. Uh, and he just, and I, and I said to him, I just feel like I want to keep making games. And this was back during the time they were still saying, you know, games were a fad and all this other stuff. And he said, just, you know, do what you love, do what you love and the money will follow. You know, and so, you know, whether or not, I mean, you need enough money to support yourself. Um, and I certainly, you know, back then I would have been better financially off if I had gone the IBM path, but I don't regret a single minute of it. You know, like I've, I've been there at the very beginning of some kick-ass franchises and, you know, I'm, su I've been super blessed in my career. So, um, I would, I think it's important that, that whatever somebody is doing, if they're not happy doing it, change. Or if you're not happy working where you're working, you know, change if yeah, you can. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's just do one final question. Okay. How does your board game development compare to your video game development? What advantages do you find in one format that you can't have in the other? Um, well, they start out the same. Uh, they start out the same. I, I tend to be a method designer, um, like just immerse myself in whatever topic that I'm interested in. Um, then I identify the systems. And once I feel like I know what the systems are and how they all work together, I find out where I can put the player in. In like in Empire of Sin, the player could have been a whole variety of things. Could have been a cop, could have been the FBI, could have been Elliot, or not, Bureau of Prohibition, FBI didn't exist. Could have been Elliot Ness, but instead I wanted you to play one of 14 different characters. Um, in the board games that I have, nobody... Um, I can do things with those games that nobody in the right mind would ever do, like have 50,000 individual pieces that are physical pieces. So I can do things like that. Um, I also like that I can, uh, that I can, I can show the hand of the designer and say who has the first turn. So in every single one of my board games, the deciding who goes first, uh, there, there's always a, that is always a, an incredibly crafted moment in my games. I agonize over that. I don't ever throw it away. When I see that in a board game, it's like whoever's oldest goes first. It's like, oh my God, you had such a chance. You see, in video games, we don't have, you don't see the hand of the designer. But board games, in that question, you always do. And so for me, um, for me, I, I take advantage of that because it's the only chance that I will actually be there in those games. Wow, that's great insight. I, I never really considered that. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really enlightening and fun talking with you. And I'm sure our audience has uh, enjoyed it as well. Okay, thank you so much. And to the audience, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And a huge thank you to our sponsors and EA for making this possible. Please come back to join us in the afternoon at 2.25 p.m. EST for more content.